Hey you, and welcome. My name is Mike, and in this old video, we're going to... We're going to a town named after what we, what we always associate Australia with. Snow. Now, I'll watch myself not to do an accent like I usually do, because they're just so bad and I can't resist. Crocky. Snowtown is located in South Australia in the south of Australia. They really didn't mess about when they named their states. It's a small town, like 500 people small, 93 miles north of Adelaide. So why are we even talking about it? Right, well in the 90s, a fella named John Bunting. He, he had a great idea, according to himself. Others would disagree, and in a bank vault in Snowtown he started storing barrels for some weird reason. A reason we'll get into, so let's. The main character in our story is John Justin Bunting. John was born in 1966 in Inala. I'm gonna butcher these, so I'll just say things I'm not too sure of the pronunciation of. I'll say it with an Australian accent. Inala, Queensland, to parents Tom and Jan. It was a working class town with a high crime rate, but John's parents did their best to give their only child the most they could and bring him up in a proper way. Unfortunately, due to a childhood illness, John Bunting, he, uh, he lost, he lost his sense of smell. Something that will, uh, come in handy when, uh, uh, we'll get into it. So John was a regular kid, enjoyed photography, enjoyed digging. Like digging, like literally digging, like digging a hole. To Europe. But his hobbies weren't the only things that kept his mind occupied. The teenage John showed an interest in other things as well, namely, firearms and World War II. But, um, there was one part of WW2 that interested him a lot. As you can imagine, it's the part that's usually a fucking warning sign. Nazis and fascism and their ideologies, especially regarding homosexuals and stuff. John then started working in a crematorium in Queensland, and he was very interested in human anatomy. Eventually, he was let go from the crematorium job. Apparently, he loved it, was really good at it, very, very good with uh, dead bodies. I'm not sure what that means. But his um, skills in dead people will come in handy, just like his lack of smell. John, eventually with some friends, ended up moving to the suburbs of Adelaide, an area that was pretty rough at the time. There he got a job with South Australia Meat Corporation, chopping up meat I guess, and in the year of 89, 1989 to you, 23 year old John made some friends, adding a fella named Mark Ray Hayden to his list of future accomplices. Mark was a simple man, not in the good way, more of the easily manipulated way, who would go on to, um, ah, you know yourself. Then, in 1991, John moved to Salisbury North. He got married to a woman named Veronica, who was also quite a simple person, and John was not good to her. But he made friends with a neighbor, a neighbor named Robert Wagner, who would be his, um, his, like, little, I don't know, what'd you call it? Sidekick. Robert had a troubled past. He was picked up from the streets by Barry Vanessa Lane, a transvestite with whom Robert had a relationship with. Barry was a convicted pedo. As you can imagine, John did not like that, but he became, you know, very good friends with uh, Robert Wagner. And John would tell Robert that John, he was sexually abused by uh, one of his friend's older brothers when he was a child. He never got justice because the, that guy who abused John, it was actually killed in a car crash. So, you can see John would hate, uh, yeah. So this would lead to John deciding to take things into his own hands, as he had this anger within him. That he, yeah, he would. 
much like John did with his friend Mark Hayden, Robert Wagner too was receptive of his ideas, and they became a little squad. And John got back into an old hobby of his, digging holes. Holes that would come in handy in the future years. He also got chummy with Barry Lane, even though he found him repulsive. He was getting info on other people like him in the area. In August 1992, Clinton Trezice disappeared. He was the first to go. See, John, he created this wall, a wall of rock spiders, is what he called them. Imagine just like a wall with pictures of targets for John, with like red string. The people on the wall were known homosexuals. To John, that also meant they were pedos too. See, it was called the Rock Spider Wall. The, why it was called that is because I'd never heard of this before. Rock spider in Australian slang is a term for a pedo. Because, like a rock spider, they're always getting into little crack- oh, Jesus Christ. In 1994, John began an affair with an Elizabeth Harvey, and through her, he met her 14-year-old son, James Vlasicus. He would be another person groomed by John, and properly groomed this time, as John became like a father figure to him. So while John was grooming him, his next target would be a guy named Ray Davies. He was last seen in 1995. See, Ray had been in a relationship with a woman named Suzanne Allen. These were people John knew. And when Suzanne's seven-year-old grandson told her Ray had sexually abused him, that was reported to the police. However, it was at that very moment that Ray disappeared and would never be seen again. John Bunting would later detail to James Vlasicus what he had done to Ray in detail. He had been tortured to death. They also decided to make a bit of money out of it, you know, while they were at it. They sold the caravan Ray lived in, and then would, you know, take his social security, get a bit of kibosh out of that for, you know, government like welfare and whatnot. Suzanne Allen, Ray Davies' ex, was the next to go. She went as John Bunting, she wanted to get with John, John just found her rather annoying. Any money she had or was getting went swiftly after. She was reported missing, John Bunting spoken with, but that was it. Michael Gardner disappeared in 1997. See, he was a cousin of Robert Wagner's girlfriend. At one point, Robert Wagner, his girlfriend, his girlfriend's son and Michael Gardner were like playing a little board game together. And at one point, Michael Gardner put his hand over uh, Wagner's girlfriend's son's mouth, like to shush him. Robert Wagner was horrified by that, as Michael Gardner was gay. Next was Barry Vanessa Lane, who disappeared in October 1997. Barry had to go, as he knew too much. With Barry's boyfriend, Thomas Trevelyan, found a month later, hanging in a tree. Police thought he got up there and did it to himself. He didn't. Gavin Porter disappeared in April 1998. He was a friend of James Vlasicus. He was also a drug user. John Bunting wasn't a fan of that, and therefore wasn't a fan of Gavin Porter being alive. Now, much like they had done to Suzanne Allen, with all of their victims, or nearly all their victims, they continued to withdraw from their, like, social security. So, like, they would get their details, their PIN numbers and all that stuff before they kill them. Get paid. In August 1998, Troy Ude disappeared. James Vlaskis told John Bunting that Troy, his half-brother, sexually abused him when he was younger. So, Troy Ude was also on the rock spider wall. Troy was tortured to death by Bunting, Vlaskis... Wagner and Hayden, he was tortured while the album Throwing Copper by Live was playing, as John Bunting, he loved that album. Now, I think, though, that's torture enough. So, I hear, you know, what you're asking, right? Some of these people who disappeared would be found. It would be, you know, an unsolved murder, their bones were found. Or, like at Trevelyan, he'd be found in a tree and it'd be ruled a suicide. But most of them just disappeared. So, where did they go to? 
John Bunting had a few barrels in his shed, and he kept digging holes. The barrels and the holes are separate, by the way. Some went into the holes, some went into the barrels in the shed. Running out of room over here. Those barrels, uh, John would, uh, from time to time, have a goo. You know, he'd pop, pop the head in. Yeah, yeah, that's a rotting corpse, all right. Cool. Remember John Bunting, he had no sense of smell. The others said it was, um, well, it was what you can imagine it was. Next to go was Fred Brooks. He was last seen alive on the 17th of September, 1998. He was tortured with electrical devices, beaten, cigarettes put out on his skin, strangled to unconsciousness, woken up, strangled to unconsciousness again, his toes crushed, and he was also tortured by having throwing copper play on repeat. John and Robert were pretty impressed by how much pain Fred took before they killed him. And he too was put in a barrel. The gruesome foursome, John Bunting, James Vlaskis, Robert Wagner, and Mark Hayden, their next target was Gary O'Dwyer. He was physically and mentally disabled after being in a car crash, and was targeted for financial reasons. See, it's funny because, you know, what started out as, like, they are obviously twisted, fucked in the head. But in their twisted way, they thought they were doing some kind of good for the community by getting rid of these, what well, they assumed were predators, right? It quickly went from that to, uh, he's got a bit of money. Let's get him. James befriended him. And when they all decided to have a few drinks together one night, Robert Wagner jumped him and they began torturing him. John Bunting would later say, that Gary O'Dwyer was another rock spider. When, you know, to be fair, when you have an electrical cable attached to your urethra, I believe is what they did, uh, you'll say pretty much anything. Less than a month later, Mark Hayden's wife, Elizabeth Hayden, disappeared. It turned out Mark Hayden had told her about some of the murders, and so she had to leave leave life itself. She would be reported missing by a neighbour, at which point you know when the police started having a gander. They found it fascinating that her husband, Mark Hayden, he didn't report her missing at all, and he, he would just say, yeah, she just ran off. You know? John and Robert were then questioned soon after, as police started connecting dots regarding folk who'd gone missing, and Mark, John and Robert all knew each other. And so, John Bunting feeling a bit of heat, those barrels in his shed had to go. Now remember, he also had people, um, under the L house. But it was the barrels, you know, that he was worried about, as they were just sitting in the shed. So the barrels have to go. Go where? You know? Well, first off, he put the, some of the barrels in a car, in a land cruiser. And he parked it outside you know, a family friend's house. Uh, a, f a family called the Freemans. He just, you know, asked them if he could leave the car there. They said, sure when they uh, complained about the smell and their neighbors began complaining about the smell coming from the barrels, he told them, there's kangaroos in them. There's some roos in there. <sighs> Sorry. He would tell the Freemans that, yeah, there was kangaroos in there because he's starting a company where they're gonna use, turn kangaroos into pet food. So the barrels were somewhere else away from John Bunting. He thought, you know, it was safe. You know, they'd never be found. Until the Freemans told John he needed to get that car out of there, because they were moving, they were moving house. They were moving to Snowtown. Good old Snowtown, small, about a hundred miles away. John said, hey, good idea. John and Mark traveled to Snowtown and leased an unused bank there. The only bank in the town, and it had been closed since 1990. The barrels were then moved into the vault. In April 1999, John, you know, came to the the ringleader. He came to a realization when he was like, no, "Those barrels, they gotta go." So here's what we're gonna do, lads. We're gonna um, take the bodies out of the barrels. The bodies that you know, year, couple of years old, some of them, rotting, decomposing bodies cut them up into small pieces, you know, snip, 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 Nikki. and then we're going to fill the bottom of the barrels with cement. We'll put the bodies, bits of them, back in, and then we'll dump them in the sea. 
they started this process, but they wouldn't finish. And they had one more victim. 24-year-old David Johnson was last seen alive in May 1999. He was James Vlasicus's stepbrother. He was neither a rock spider nor gay, but John wanted him gone regardless. So they lured him to the bank in Snowtown and tortured him. While doing so, they played music. This time, it was a tune called Voices of Death. It was a recording he had made with previous victims. The sounds they made while being tortured. And so, David Johnson too was cut up and barreled. But not before. Robert Wagner, um... He cut off a bit of David Johnson's flesh. Brought it home, cooked it up, and him and John ate it. So they were cannibals too. But by now the police were closing in. John Bunting and Robert Wagner were major people of interest in the disappearance of Elizabeth Hayden and Barry Vanessa Lane, who had been missing there for years at that point, especially when they noticed that regular withdrawals were being made from Barry's bank account. And a turning point came when, on the 16th of May 1999, a Snowtown police patrol saw a land cruiser parked in a driveway, the Freeman's driveway, and during a registration number check, realized this was a vehicle of interest for a missing person's case. So yeah, that was John Bunting's car, still parked outside the Freeman's house, even though they had moved to Snowtown. They were too nice letting him do that. And so the police spoke with the Freemans who said, said yeah, yeah, that's, that's the car. Uh, he left it parked out here. He left it here after he dropped off some barrels at a bank, other side of town. A bank rented for $60 a month. And that's when the police decided to search the bank. Quite a discovery was made. There were cardboard boxes everywhere, containing different computer parts. They also found a receipt showing the purchase of disposable gloves, rubbish bags, and air fresheners. And that's before they went into the vault where a discovery was made far more horrific than they ever anticipated. Six barrels containing eight people. I guess we weren't surprised with what we found um, given the smell coming from the place. Police entered the Old State Bank building in Snowtown's main street and manipulated the lock of the vault. Inside the vault, they found six plastic containers packed with human remains. They would find another two people under John Bunting's home. On the 21st of May, John Bunting, Mark Hayden and Robert Wagner were arrested. Tonight, it's already Australia's worst serial killing, and it's not over yet. Body number 10 has been found buried in the backyard of a house. Police now fear the toll could rise to at least 12. Good evening. First tonight, the toll continues to rise in the bodies in the bank murder case. Detectives now believe the total number of victims could reach 12. They're investigating whether a four-year-old murder mystery from Lower Light should be drawn into the equation. This morning, more remains were found at Salisbury North. Reporter Jessica Sullivan is at the scene. Jessica? Yes, Graham. Well, detectives were back at Waterloo Corner Road this morning where they found yet another body. Again, the remains were found in the backyard of this home, which up until recently was rented by John Bunting. Now, as we know, he was one of the men who appeared in court on Friday charged with murder. In other developments, we understand that some of the houses along this road are going to be demolished because of the tragic nature of this event, and police still aren't ruling out further discoveries. The motive for the murders was twofold. As we, as we said, you know, one was eliminating the risks to society by killing off the gays and the rock spiders, which was basically whoever they decided to kill was a rock spider. The other reason was just money. But of course, you know, to the police when they're arrested, you know, rock spiders and homosexuals were the disease, and they were the cure. 
There was no question about John Bunting being the head honcho, Robert Wagner being his right hand man. Mark Hayden was an outsider, kind of, in the gang. Because John Bunting said that the only real people, the only real members of the group, were those who had been sexually assaulted. And John, Robert, and James all had been. Mark hadn't. It also seems like Mark never actually participated, or never did any of the real killing. He was there during the torturing, probably took part in the torture, and helped with the cleanup. But he never actually killed anybody. Certainly a useful person for John to have around, easily manipulatable. Robert Wagner, he too fell into John's indoctrination, and he too was a cold-blooded killer. He loved to kill. As for James Vasquez, he kind of fell into John's lap as a 14-year-old boy, easily manipulatable as, cause as he looked up to John. He was brainwashed, not that I suppose it's any excuse, but he was. The group had a scheme while committing their crimes. The targeting of specific people, torture, extraction of information. In at least three cases, the victims were forced to call their attackers, Lord Sir, <coughs> sorry, Australian accent. Lord Sir, good, master. They would also voice record their victims, then murder them via strangulation, dispose of their bodies, and use false impersonation to retrieve financial benefits, and also used false information to make people believe the victims were still alive. Sometimes while being tortured, they would get the victims to say certain lines, certain phrases, so that they could use them, you know, maybe over the phone. ...to offer support. They're not ruling out further discoveries. The number of people that will ultimately appear in court, or indeed the number of uh, deceased people that we uncover, still is yet to be determined. The cause of death of any of the ten victims is still not known, but police say one of the eight Snowtown bodies was immersed in a barrel of hydrochloric acid. Three people are facing charges. They are Robert Joe Wagner, John Justin Bunting and Mark Ray Hayden. Only one victim has so far been positively identified and police hope to release names later this week. Through tattoos and, uh, and teeth, uh... Uh, and, uh, and scars and broken bones, uh, there's a whole variety of ways that we will use to, uh, to make a positive identification. Due to the evidence against John and Robert, their case in court was a joint trial. Robert Wagner pled guilty to the murders of Barry Lane, Fred Brooks and David Johnson. John did not plead guilty to any of the charges against him. James Vlasikis had a major role in the trial against John and Robert. He testified against both of them in exchange for a plea deal, as the prosecutors knew he was just a pawn. After an almost 12 month trial, the two were found guilty in the murders of 11 people. They had 12 victims, but Suzanne Allen they were never found guilty of her murder, as there was a lack of evidence. John Bunting and Robert Wagner were each sentenced to one life term for every victim. So that's 11 consecutive terms of life imprisonment without the possibility of parole for John. Robert Wagner got 10 of those old life sentences. Robert said at his sentencing, pedophiles are doing terrible things to children. The authorities didn't do anything about it. I decided to take action. I took that action. Thank you. What a hero he was. In his own eyes. The jury verdicts confirm Bunting and Wagner as Australia's worst serial killers. Theirs was a remorseless and relentless campaign of murder. As for Mark Hayden, he had a trial of his own. As I said before, he wasn't part of the actual murdering of a victim. In fact, he may not have even been part of the torturing. But he was convicted of assisting in seven of the murders. He was sentenced to 25 years with an 18-year non-parole period. In 2017, he applied for parole and it was refused. James Vlasikis was sentenced to life with the minimum of 26 years. He will be eligible for parole in 2025. And so ends the story of the Snowtown 
murders, also sometimes called bodies in barrels in a bank vault. Um, it's pretty tragic and horrific and disturbing. I mean, the perpetrators were all victimized by rock spiders who then went on to... They were just serial killers at the end of the day. People who got real enjoyment out of torture, you know, um, whether they believed their victims were guilty or not, they just did it for the crack. Such a disturbing story, you know, of what happened down under, all around. I think there's, you know, the final word on this one, the word that can sum everything up. It's gotta be, you know, crikey! Thank you so much for watching, I really appreciate it. I will see you as always real soon in the next video. Take care of yourselves. I love ya. Mike out.